uh, Stevens with Pipeline Plastics. And uh, Stephen, if you wouldn't mind coming on, uh, I'd appreciate that at this point. Um, and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate the introduction. So I'm Stephen Boris. I'm Vice President of Engineering at Pipeline Plastics. We're a major polyethylene pipe manufacturer in the United States. Um, been in polyethylene pipe for 30 plus years. I just say the plus now after 30 and um, been in all aspects of it. And I, I'm very excited about the, the time we're at in our industry with everything we have going on and the, and the growth that we're seeing and the uh, problems that we're solving with today's infrastructure. So it's great. Well, speaking of problems, uh, you have a new background, Stephen. Tell us about that. Yeah, so this is just a screenshot of uh, 50,000 feet of polyethylene pipe, 24 inch, that uh, was shipped up to Oklahoma, uh, southeastern Oklahoma. So the mayor of the town there in Tishomingo, Oklahoma, had an economic growth in, uh, vision for that, for that area. And one thing they were lacking for that was water. So they were able to work with multiple agencies. So they had an Indian agency uh, for the Indian tribe located there. They had local um, uh, agencies. They had state agencies from the state of Oklahoma and federal. They're able to get all of those to uh, contribute funds to fund a uh, 50,000 foot run from a new water well from the aquifer that was outside of town to a treatment plant so they could get all of this new economic growth potential for Murray State College and their hospitality group, potentially for a new Indian casino and hotel, um, all sorts of things that would not be possible without the resource such as just clean water. Yeah, my my well quit working last weekend, Stephen. I got home and my wife said, well, I'm sure glad you're home, but guess what? There's no water. Uh, until you don't have it, you don't realize how important water is. And certainly economic development is not going to work without water. Right. Um, okay. With that, I want to uh, thank my uh, bench. So what's our bench? Uh, Alan Ambler, come on. Our bench is those experts that are sitting there waiting for your questions. Please use the Q&A. Alan Ambler, welcome. Hey, Pete. So uh, if you've attended our webinars before, you know that we've got a, a group of people, these fellows that you're looking at here that are going to answer your question uh, as you type it. And hopefully that'll spurn even more questions. So definitely write us your questions. We're here to support uh, anything that's a, a, a very topical to what Stephen's talking about or the webinar content. We could uh, very well choose to answer that live as we go through. So uh, definitely happy to be here, Pete. Happy to see all of Stephen pipe that he's showing us there and love to uh, share about projects. That's one of my favorite thing uh, to do is to hear about infrastructure all over the country. So definitely share that information with us. Thank you, Alan Ambler. Stephen, let's start, I'll turn it over to you, but let's start with who is the Plastics Pipe Institute? How are they different than the Alliance and what role do they play? And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Let me, uh, let me share my screen with you here and we'll, we'll get going. See if I can figure out the technology today. You got it. Did it come up? Uh, yeah, you got to pick the other screen. You're on. It's showing oh. Zoom right now. Sorry about that. I thought I picked screen two. All that practice and it still didn't work. Well, that's why they don't let me do it anymore, because I can't figure out the difference between screen one and screen two. Um, all right, uh, Alan, could you come on and while he's figuring that out, could you tell us a little bit about the Plastics Pipe Institute? You bet. So the Plastic Pipe Institute is a group that uh, studies all plastic pipe or plastics in general and then produces uh, great re references and resources for us to be able to navigate through uh, designing with that plastic material. Uh, and that was just timely enough for Stephen to be able to take it away here, Stephen. There we go. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. I think I got it now. So Let's start with the Plastics Pipe Institute top 10 resources. Um, these are the ones we picked that we thought would be the most of interest. And uh, you have to remember, there are dozens of resources available through the PE Alliance, as well as the Plastics Pipe Institute. 
So um, I think one of the one of the main um, resources that everybody needs to be familiar with if you're going to deal with polyethylene pipe is the handbook of polyethylene pipe. So this is literally a culmination of probably 50 years of experience um, that was put together by various experts around the country over all these years. It started out as individual reports, individual notes, individual documents. And then over time, we said, hey, we got a lot of these things. Let's put them into a manual. Uh, and so this is the this is the be all end all of polyethylene pipe. It covers every application, every aspect of the material, of shipping and handling, the manufacturing, um, design of different types of applications, burial, marine environment, uh, geothermal, all of it. So this is the a great resource. And what's nice about it, it's available for free download. Uh, every chapter is available as a PDF download from the Plastics Pipe Institute website, uh, plasticpipe.org. Or if you're like me and you still like a book, um, you can order a hardback copy of this book uh, at a very low price and have that on your shelf for review. So anyway, this is a great resource to go to. It's kind of like a textbook. It goes through, gives you all the background and information, and then gives you examples of how to apply it. So we charge 60 bucks for the book. Uh, and I think that's the same thing PPI. I just buy 12 of them at a time and we ship it out to you. Um, so that is available for that cost. Right. Yeah, I say it's not it's not a great cost. Or like I said, if you if you just want to do the PDF versions, you can do that as for free. Uh, and there's a lot more on there too. So there's calculators, there's software installation guides, technical notes, as well as technical reports that have been developed over the years. It's kind of an archive place. Hundreds and hundreds of case studies are available on both the PPI website as well as the P Alliance website. And then installation practices and guides such as electrofusion and things like that. We'll go through a few of those. So today the scope of the presentation is gonna cover more or less like the specification. How do I specify polyethylene pipe for a, for a water wastewater project? And then it'll go into some design aspects of that. Um, we'll cover some installation and then some maintenance type things if you need to, such as squeeze off, uh, joining, different things like that. And then we'll get into specific topics from the PE Pipe Handbook. And well, it'll be outside what's in the PE Pipe Handbook specifically, or the field manual for municipal applications, which again is available on the website for free download. So let's get into it. So. The first document, and this is, this is really getting into the base of where polyethylene pipe or polyethylene compounds that are used for pipe comes from. The polyethylene that is used to make pressure pipe is an extremely engineered type polyethylene. It's not the same type polyethylene that you use for your trash bags, which is low density, very stretchy. It's not the same type of polyethylene that your one gallon milk jug is made from, which again is polyethylene. It's not the same as your bleach bottle. Again, there's hundreds of types. The type of polyethylene used to make pressure pipe is a highly engineered compound specifically for this application. So it goes through a lot of testing, a lot of analysis and verification of its long-term performance properties, short-term and long-term, to verify it can be used in a, in a long-term uh, durable application such as pipe. Each compound is then listed by the Plastics Pipe Institute in a document called PPI's Technical Report 4 or TR4. It lists the hydrostatic design basis, hydrostatic design stress, and MRS, if it has one, of those listed materials. So it's a great resource to go to to see, all right, does my pipe manufacturer, is he using a material that's listed in PPI TR4? That means it's gone through this analysis. Let me show you a sample of what it would go through. Um, it's gone through all of this, uh, probably about two years is about the minimum time it takes to get this data put together. So to have multiple lots of material that has to go through this, what's called a stress regression analysis to see, all right, let me put pipes on test. All of these little um, X's represent a failed piece of pipe on at a certain pressure or a certain stress level. And then you see how long it takes before it fails. Now this is on a log log scale, so it looks like it's very linear. When in fact, if you put it on Cartesian coordinates, 
it's very it's very logarithmic so it starts out and it kind of goes like this and then it becomes asymptotic very quickly uh, so you can then forecast a very long uh, points in time so you understand here this is one year here where this is 50 years here and this is over 100 years here so you can see just this region it becomes pretty flat so this is how we 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 determine what is the long term HDS or hydrostatic design stress that this material can be used at. And the definition of HDS is a stress level with high probability that failure will not occur. So that's where we start from, from, um, from our calculation about how we get from a stress in the material to how we get to a pressure rating for the pipe. Alan, you, you got some, Dad? Yeah, I was just waiting for the 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 natural pause. Uh, good good job. This is um, sorry, Stephen. This is one of my favorite graphs. So I I just couldn't keep my mouth shut because uh, exactly what you're explaining. So what's behind all of this, if I'm correct, is lots of vats of pipe where they're putting it through all of these motions and you know, really validating that that the resin that you guys have created into a pipe can satisfy this. And then not only that, but you're conservative in the difference between that design factor as well. So there's more conservancy even before we get that pipe into the field. Is that correct? Absolutely. That is correct. Because we get that question a lot and say, oh, you know, this pipe has a certain pressure rating, but I don't want to go up to that pressure rating. I want to derate it even further and be more conservative. But Alan, you're absolutely correct. So when we, when we establish the long-term strength of a material, it's way up here at 100,000 hours, right? And even further out in time beyond that. We take a design factor, which reduces that, that stress from the hydrostatic design basis all the way down to the hydrostatic design stress. That's the maximum stress of that pressure rating that that pressure rating will induce on that on that pressure vessel or that pipe. So there's a lot of conservancy, conservancy <laughs> uh, conservatism, how about that? built into this pressure rating of the pipe. It's just a basic thin wall pressure vessel equation uh, that takes the stress at the mid wall of the pipe. Uh, and then you can add different temperature factors and service factors into that. But this is for 73 degrees uh, in a water environment. This is a long-term strength that, can, that the pipe or the material can handle. So when you go to PPI TR4 and you go up and look something like uh, PE 4710 materials, um, you'll see listings of what's called dependent listings under pipe manufacturers. And each pipe manufacturer will have compounds that they're approved. They've gone through a, an evaluation process that shows they can, they can reproduce these compounds that, that have the PE 4710 designation and utilize those to make pipe with. And so if you, if you're, if you want to prove your pipe manufacturer, you can go in and take a look and make sure or have a requirement in your specification that your pipe manufacturer must have a listing in TR4. That means it's another level of scrutiny that's been put on that product that they're using the right materials for the right application. Now, it's interesting to point out, I'm just showing polyethylene here, but every thermoplastic material goes through the same process that's used in North America. That goes for uh, PVC. Every PVC compound is used. It's also listed in this uh, document. Um, polyamide materials, CPVC for hot water applications, cross-link polyethylene for hot and cold plumbing applications. They all go through this exact same evaluation process and are listed within TR4. That's how important this document is to our industry. The, uh, the next document is going to be coming from the PPI's um, Municipal Advisory Board, or MAB. So that's an independent group of municipal engineers, um, contractors, uh, university um, professors, um, con uh, like I said, um, design engineers, and other experts from the industry that say, all right, what information do we need for municipal applications specifically? So they say, well, the first thing we need is a model spec. So you got to know how to specify polyethylene for a water, for a potable water service, distribution, or transmission system. So this document was actually just updated in 2024 and republished. So this is the best, latest, and greatest information on how to specify all aspects um, dealing with polyethylene pipe for water applications. 
how to specify the material, how to specify the pipe manufacturer, how you're going to join it, how you need to be qualified to join it, how you need to store it, ship it. It goes through all of those aspects. So you don't have to start from scratch as a design engineer or an owner that wants to specify this. This is a great template uh, that'll give you 95% of everything you need for your project. And then you can take it and, and customize it for your specific application. So it covers, you know, how are you going to do the installation? How are you going to reference uh, AWWA M55, which we'll talk about later for burial and, and backfill? So it goes through all of those things. So you don't have to research all that yourself. So some of the things you'll see in the model spec, so it's going to it's going to um, specify the types of material, PE 4710 pressure classes. You can see here for the larger diameter, C906, which covers four inch through 65 inch pipe, you have DR17, DR135, DR11, and DR9 are all allowed within this document. So that gives you a pressure class rating from 250 PSI at the heavy wall DR9 all the way down to 125 PSI, working pressure rating, uh, surges on top of that. We'll talk about that later uh, for a DR17. So you have allowable surge for that DR17s at 188 PSI. And your occasional surge uh, is all the way up to two times the pressure class, 250 PSI. Now, the one thing to note here, though, is that for AWWAC 901, which is for small diameter water service lines, half inch through three inch, for water service line, C901 now only recognizes DR9 for that application. Because it is such a rigorous application, this covers all installation and burial and uses as, usage, usage aspects for a service application. Because uh, we know it's not going to be buried with the same amount of rigor and care that a distribution or transmission line would. It's going to be a shallower bury mainly, usually 12 inches or less. Not always, but can be. And so a DR9 will give you more robustness for that product to assure that you still have that 100-year design life. Um, it's interesting to note here also for design what is recommended. So for normal flow, four feet per second, the average that we see around the country is 6.7 feet per second. So a four foot per second average flow uh, or normal flow um, is not uncommon. In fact, that's what's recommended. Eight feet per second for occasional flow. So all that needs to be taken into account in your designs. And then also for 55 cycles per day. Uh, and all that comes together to give you a 100-year design life for fatigue and for usage. Now, that's going to be key because you don't want a 100-year estimation or it might last 100 years. This is going to take all the aspects of polyethylene pipe and say, I'm going to get a 100-year design life for this product. It gives you the material specification they're going to use for large diameter, 4 inch through 65 inch. You want that made and manufactured according to AWWA C906. You will probably want it NSF certified for potable water applications. So the toxicology aspects of it would be NSF 61. You might see pipe labeled also NSF 14. Uh, NSF 14 means it has been certified not just for standard 61 for potable water contact, but it's also been certified and tested to conform to C906 as well. So that gives you another level of scrutiny that you have on this product. Minimal cell classification, PE 445574C. If you go to ASTMD 3350, we'll spell out all those properties. And the CC3 or the chlorine categorization resistance number that uh, the, the material has been tested to. CC3 is the highest rating that you can get for polyethylene material. Again, again, we'll give you that 100 year design life against disinfectants uh, in, in every situation that you're dealing with in the United States. So again, all that's in here. You don't have to research it and figure it out yourself. It's all laid out for you. It talks about installation practices. So for installation, you're going to have pullback limits. You're going to have burial, different things like that. So here's just an instance for safe pull loads on polyethylene pipe. Get that question a lot. How hard, how, how much force can I put on this polyethylene pipe? Safe pull stress is going to be much less than the than the maximum tensile yield stress of the material. So let's say you want to just pull on it for an hour or less. You can go up to 1,400 PSI. Remember, the tensile yield stress on this material is about 3,500 PSI, 
maybe even up to 4,000 PSI. So you have a lot of margin of safety there that you're working with. So you won't damage the product when you're pulling it into place in certain types of applications. Hey, Peter. Hey, Stephen, we just had a question that that is Doug is answering, but it it was phrased like this. It said, so how does velocity affect the fatigue life of polyethylene? So fatigue is something that's uh, an issue for PVC, but does fatigue, is that a thing for polyethylene? You know, that's a great question. So velocity does affect it. And let me go, let me go back a slide here real quick. And I kind of went over this quickly, but this is this is an important point. So yeah, fatigue is ultimately how many types of pipes will fail. Um, they're gonna fail from corrosion if they're metallic. They're gonna fail from fatigue. Some um, metallic and thermoplastic materials can fail by by cyclic fatigue. And they're gonna fail by um maybe soil movement or rock impingement, something like that. So if you design for all of those factors to give you a hundred year life, then you're going to have a um, hundred year design life for that product. So the thing about polyethylene, you have to remember it has surge capacity because it's ductile on top of its pressure class. Not all materials have that. And pressure class means something different for every material. So just because you have a ductile iron with a certain pressure class, PVC with a certain pressure class, you don't match pressure classes when you design with polyethylene. You have to design it for its individual performance. So surge will be what, what causes the cyclic fatigue. So anytime you have a water hammer effect, let's say at, at eight feet per second, you're gonna have a surge or a, a fatigue event built into that. If it happens 55 times a day plus, uh, like say for a force main, uh, that's gonna be millions of cycles over a hundred years. Polyethylene has been tested for 10 million plus cycles with full cyclic fatigue from full pressure class to double the pressure class. Not just, not just starting with a pressure class of say 125 and testing it at 80 PSI, like it's going to be used. We test it at 125 and then double that to 250 and go through millions of cycles to make sure ductile fatigue will not be an issue for polyethylene. Great question. Thank you. Um, real quickly, just to just to flange this up here. So also on trenches installations, there's some other documents you can go to. ASTM F1962, which is for maxi horizontal directional drilling guidance. Or you can also go to PPI's BoreAid, which is a, a soft online software, which will give you directional drill um, protocols and designs um, so you, you can get a first look at how that directional drill is going to look. What sizes do I need to use? What angles can I use? What depth do I need to go to? Different things like that. And then HDPE app uh, is the design software that pretty much covers everything in the PE pipe handbook is covered in, in real time calculations uh, online um, at these, at these uh, URLs for the um, PPI handbook and design. So another thing we see a lot about is 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 blocking, anchor blocking, and how do you how do you restrain polyethylene pipe? So first of all, know that it's very easy to restrain polyethylene pipe because it has a lower modulus than other materials. The resulting force from any type of a let's just say thermal cycling event or anything like that, or soil movement, the amount of force put, uh, generated by the polyethylene is going to be much much smaller than it will be for that same event on a metal uh, metallic pipe, such as ductile iron or even PVC. So you have to look at it individually. So there was a new study just put out um, by uh, Cornell University um, that was sponsored by the Plastics Pipe Institute. And they looked at all the aspects of a buried pipe design that we didn't take into account before and then came up with new anchor block sizing requirements. And all this is within will be put into the PE pipe handbook when it's designed, but it's already included into the HTTP app um, software online. So if you want to take a look at that. So let me go back real quick. So what it did, and this is this last bullet point is really what, what the crux of it is. It said, all right, let's look at soil restraint. Let's look at temperatures. Let's look at what really happens to this system when it's buried in the ground. And what it did is it essentially took the old design 
of, of anchor blocks and cut those in about a third of what they would uh, have been in the past. Now that this is a properly designed uh, restraint system, uh, our restraint analysis, if you will, and can then put proper um, thrust blocks in in place and how I designed those thrust blocks. So, so some Steven, of the things it did. Let me interject a bit. Oh, so um, you bet. all polyethylene itself, once we get to that fusion joint, that is a self-restrained joint. Uh, so if we are only really looking at anchor blocks um, for HDPE pipe when we are connecting to other materials or valves or other things like that as we're we're designing these. Isn't that, is that, that correct, Stephen? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't even mention that point. But you're exactly right. You don't really need them very often. The only time you need an anchor block to, to restrain any type of movement is when you're connecting to an appurtenance, such as a valve, uh, going through a wall, if you will, into a um, uh, reservoir or whatever it might be, and you need to restrain the polyethylene from movement. Uh, the, each individual joint is going to be fully restrained if it's heat fused, and there is no uh, need to uh, anchor that in any way. So it really reduces the amount of uh, blocking that you need overall. So this new, this new design, as you can see uh, an example here from the HTPE app software, it gives you, for a certain situation, 24-inch pipe, DR17, um, you know, what does my block dimensions need to look like? How much reinforcement do I need? So it takes all of these things into account with the Poisson's forces and ratios um, that it didn't before to give you a, a now a, a proper anchor block design that'll work to make sure that if you are hooking up to a valve body that you don't want to have move in any way, It'll make sure that it can restrain that, and it won't uh, won't be an issue. The other uh, document, which again was updated, I think this was updated maybe two years ago now, is the AWWA M55 Design and Installation Manual for Polyethylene Pipe. This is a great resource. So this is this is strictly focused on municipal applications. And it has 11 chapters, all dealing with engineering properties of the material, how you come up with the different working pressure ratings and pressure classes and surges, uh, surge capacities for these different pipes. External loads, um, chapter five was all redone by Amster Howard recently to make sure everybody's using the same terminology and the same type of compaction requirements, same type of soil requirements for that flexible pipe design um, interaction that you have to have with, with any flexible pipe design, which is ductile iron, PVC, corrugated metal, polyethylene, all of those use the exact same design practice, which is a so pipe soil interactive design to make sure you get properly compacted soils um, to give you a nice round pipe and not, not overly deflect the, prop, the pipe during installation or during use. Um, so all that's been revised um, to give you the latest and greatest joining and fittings that are available. There's been a, a big change in the fittings available in the last seven or eight years with all the different types of mechanical fittings available, electrofusion fittings, uh, MJ adapters, flange adapters. It talks about all of those. Installation practices, maintenance and repair. That's a great chapter that people need to be aware of. If, a, if, if the pipe ever gets damaged and needs to be repaired, there's very easy ways to do it. Um, the neat thing that's also included here is the Appendix B. That's, very, that's all brand new. That gives you earthquake design applications. What's neat about that is polyethylene is inherently earthquake resistant because of its ductility and its fully restrained joints, as we talked about earlier. If you have a fully restrained system and a ductile system, it's going to be by nature earthquake resistant. And there's many, many um, real life situations that have been studied around the world during major earthquake events in Japan, Chile, um, uh, New Zealand, uh, that show that polyethylene piping systems have no failures during these massive earthquake events where you really need your infrastructure to, to, to maintain its integrity. We talked a little bit about, I think you heard from Dan earlier about the engineering package that's available. That's a great resource. It's a great compendium of, of all the different types of documents that you might need for a municipal application. Um, covers design, specifying, installing, and operating polyethylene piping systems. 
Um, everything we're talking about today is going to be included in that. We've talked about a few things already, the model spec, the MAB contacts. We'll talk about the rest of these here in a minute. Um, but it's a great resource. Again, if you want that, contact Dan Landy afterwards during the survey, and uh, he'll ship you off the engineer's package, which has all this information contained within it. Material and handling guide is very important for any pipe that you might have. How do I handle it? So polyethylene might be a little bit different. For one thing, it's going to be lighter um, than, than a lot of the piping products you're used to handling. Uh, but it still needs substantial equipment to handle it, and it has to be handled in the right way. So there's a PPI material handling guide for pipe and fittings. It was published in 2018. It's available on the website. And it's going to talk about how do I, how do I unload the pipe? What do I look at when it gets to the job site? Um, what type of equipment do I need? Is it going to be in links? Is it going to be in coils? Is it going to be in bundles? How do I how do I do that? And again, like I said, the inspection of it when it gets to the job site is very important as well. Um, you want to store it uh, usually in a storage yard when it gets to the pipe before it's used on the project, and you need to cut it to length in certain cases. So there's going to talk about the handling guide talks about many aspects of that. So you can see here just as a quick example. Um, this is a piece of 54 or 63 inch pipe, I believe, actually, um, out of one of our Texas plants. And you can see that it's recommended to lift polyethylene pipe with nylon straps. This makes sure that you don't damage it. You have a large enough um, back uh, forklift or telehandler that can lift it properly. Um, you have crew people out of the way, so the driver may not be able to see them. It takes into that into account. And then you're going to lift it and put it into the, onto the truck and certain chocks and blocks to make sure it stays put. So that's just a few of the basic aspects that you want to look at for polyethylene. Here's one thing that you, um, you don't want to do when it gets to the job site. Let's take a look at this. This um, uh, operator is, is very uh, good at his job, you can see. He's very good at um, lining up the... Um, the bucket to make sure he's going to get what he needs to lift this pipe off the truck appropriately. He's taking great care and making sure he lines it up. And then once he is sure he's ready to go, he's going to unload this pipe in his own particular fashion. Now, that's what you don't want to do when you unload the pipe. Um, the interesting thing about it is the pipe wasn't damaged. So it's okay, but a lot of safety aspects associated with this. And uh, the truck driver actually took this video you know, thinking, huh, what is he going to do here? And so he knew something that was going to happen that he wanted to capture. So what do you have to say about this one, Alan? Well, you know, sometimes we do get lucky and find those videos that show exactly what not to do. And uh, this is this is one of those. So uh, the Alliance does spend a, a fair amount of time trying to trying to find videos and definitely share it with us. So um, we've got about 30 minutes left, Stephen, and you've got uh, probably about 50 slides. So um, we'll have to, to start that a little bit there. And hopefully Pete doesn't interrupt too much. You bet. Keep it going. Um, the inspection form is, is very important as well. So this is a, a great example. It comes out of MAB6 for incoming pipe material inspection. So it just kind of makes sure that, okay, here's my project name, the inspector name. What am I getting? Am I actually getting on that truck before I unload it? Am I going to get everything I'm supposed to be getting on that truck? Is it the right size? Is it the right DR, a wall thickness? Is it made to the right specification? Does it have all the right markings on it for that I'm supposed to be getting? Check all these things before you unload it. That way, if there's an issue, um, maybe something wasn't shipped right or the pipe may have been damaged during shipment, you'll have all that documented before you unload it. And then it'll make it much easier to, um, to send that pipe back and be loaded the right way or to replace a damaged pipe and anything that what it might be than if you had to unload it and then try to load it back on the job site. Stacking heights as well. Um, polyethylene pipe, you can stack. Uh, the larger diameters, though, it's recommended that you don't stack more than one high. Uh, once you get up below 36 inch, you can stack it two, three, four, even 10 high, as long as it's chocked properly and protected properly or it's not going to fall off and, and roll over people. 
TN51 talks about butt fusion. Butt fusion is the is the number one heat fusion joining method for polyethylene. It doesn't require a fitting. It requires a fusion machine to align the pipe and bring it together in the right fashion. But once it's brought together and it's fused in this manner, it becomes a monolithic pipe piece at that point. Uh, there's no longer a joint that's going to come apart. Uh, again, that, that joint is now as strong as a pipe. It's fully restrained and it won't ever be a weak link that's going to be a problem within your uh, piping system. So that's the number one way of doing it. Um, there are mechanical uh, options. There's electrofusion options, which we'll talk about. Uh, but this is the, the main thing that you'll use day in, day out. It's a very simple process. And TN51 just talks through the steps of that and, and gives you the right references of how you go about uh, qualifying a, a, a fusion joiner for that process as well. So you can see here, the first step of that is to face the ends. You put the pipe into the fusion collets and you bring both ends together and these blades spin slowly around it. And that gives you a nice clean, uniform parallel surfaces. So the pipe comes together in a nice uniform manner. So this is the first step in the fusion process and one of the probably most key parts of it as well. This is what happens during a butt fusion joint. So you can see here, this is the wall thickness. You can see the two ends were brought together and it talks about the different aspects of it. So you get your, your external rollback bead and you get your internal rollback bead from the molten material that was squeezed out. And it gives you different flow profiles. You can see on the picture to the right here, um, which was a very unique piece of pipe that was, uh, that was made. I'm not sure if it was made on purpose or by accident, but it, there, it certainly uh, gave a good graphic for this example. You can see that when the pipe ends are brought together this fashion, the melt is extruded out this way and this way. And that interface is right here in the middle, which you get that what we call a co-crystallization -co zone, uh, where you get that real entanglement that give you a fully strong uh, joint. It's not just touching together or mechanical adhesion. This is a true intermolecular um, uh, crystallization area that gives you a 100% strong joint. Again, the different aspects, if you're, if you're, uh, if you want to see the, the, the details about what's really happening when the two ends come together, you have the melt zone, the radial flow, the version, the melt, the melt beads, you can take a look at that. All that is included within this document as well. Um, the next uh, method of joining, which again is very popular if you can't move a piece or you have a sp specific situation, uh, is electrofusion. Electrofusion couplers are very common. Electrofusion tees, tapping tees, saddles, whatever it might be, um, electrofusion is is a is a is an excellent alternative for that. So the Municipal Advisory Board has published two documents for that. Uh, you can see they did it very early on in their development. It was the first document they published was MAB1 and MAB2. One handles uh, 12 inch and smaller polyethylene pipe, the steps to go through to make sure you get a good electrofusion joint. And then if you're doing larger diameter, 14 inch to 30 inch, it goes through the guidance about what you need to do, what you need to look for, steps you need to take to make sure you get a good joint. Why is this important? Because you you have to go through the steps to make sure you're going to get that good joint. If you go through the steps, it's going to work every time. Very quickly, these are the steps. Cut the pipe ends. Clean the pipe ends. Can't stress this one enough. This is the first cleaning step. Mark the stab depth of your pipes. How deep does it need to go into that coupler? Then you're going to scrape it or peel the surface off. That's going to give you a nice, clean surface that that electrofusion coupling is going to bond to. And this is a, a very key part of that. Then you're going to make sure that the uh, when you stab it uh, to the mark depth, uh, that you're going deep enough to get full stab of those couplings on both sides. Uh, then you're going to, um, if you need to, put it in re-rounding clamps and alignment clamps to hold that in alignment, make sure the pipe's fully round and fully in alignment uh, to go into that coupling. Connect it to the electrofusion box, press the button. It's going to go through its process because it's read the barcode of that fitting. So it knows exactly how much energy to put into it to join it the right way. And you're done. Isn't that about it, Peter? Or uh, isn't that about it, Alan? Yeah, yeah. So uh, 
Um, the key difference between electrofusion and butt fusion is there's a little bit more operator uh, processing on the electrofusion. Uh, and both uh, both scenarios were getting back to virgin resin. So exactly the same things that uh, Stephen and his company would do at the extrusion facility when they're controlling virgin high-density polyethylene resin material to get it into a pipe, uh, even before it's delivered to your site. We're just doing the same exact thing to ensure the health of that fusion joint. So uh, that definitely good steps to follow, Stephen. You're very succinct and specific. Love it. Keep yeah. going. Can't uh, can't overemphasize the cleaning portion of this enough. That's that's what's going to give you a good joint. So if you can't uh, if you can't do a butt fusion or you, or or electrofusion, um, you may need to do a flange adapter, right? So flange adapters are very common to flange up again to an appurtenance that you will be. Maybe it's a tank, maybe it's a valve, uh, maybe it's a flow meter, whatever it might be. There are flange adapters available for that you can, what they call stub ends, that you fuse onto the polyethylene pipe, typically with a butt fusion. And then that allows you then to flange up to another another um, appurtenance. So PPI's TN38 is how you go about doing that. And more importantly, how you go about torquing those bolts to make sure you get a nice, even uh, compression of that flange adapter. So uh, what you want the bolts to do, the bolts have to overcome the pressure, the surge, any type of uh, thermodynamic or, or th temperature contraction or expansion, any type of bending that might occur, flange alignment, and then whatever variance you want to take into account. The force in these bolts has to be greater than all these other forces trying to pull that apart. So once you go through that calculation, you can see that there's a certain torque value that you need to put on all these bolts uh, to make sure that you get the right contact area and you get a fully sealed flange. Now, the nice thing about polyethylene is you don't have to use a polyethylene to polyethylene uh, flange adapter joint does not even need to use a gasket as long as it's aligned properly and as long as it's the, the bolts are torqued properly. So this is just an example. Um, so if you're doing less than 18 inch pipe, you do the 30-30 uh, rule so you're going to tighten it 30% of the recommended torque value. Then you're going to, that's to seat it all. And then you're going to start with uh, the star pattern. You're going to go to the first bolt and tighten an additional 30. Go around all the bolts and do that. Then you're going to go back to bolt one, tighten it the rest of the value. Now the last step is you're going to let that sit for four to 24 hours for it to relax and get in its final state. And then you're going to come back and do one more final torque to that torque value again to fully seat everything and make sure that you have a nice tight joint. If you're going to do greater than 18 inch pipe, you do the exact same thing, except you go through one more step and you only start with 25% of the torque value, additional 25, additional 25, and then the final value after, again, that four to 24 hour period to allow it to relax and, and creep a little bit, if you will, and make sure that you're going to have that that final force where you have a joint, uh, a flange that won't leak. If you are going to do bud fusions, uh, which is, again, um, the predominant way of doing this, you're going to say, well, how do I know that that bud fusion was done properly? Well, there's a device out there called a data logger, and it records the, the pertinent key data uh, information and parameters of that fusion joint and if you can see this, you had a 99% chance that all those joints are going to be good. Now, I say 99% chance because the only thing that could possibly go wrong is if some dirt blew in there or something like that that wasn't taken into account, um, then that's the only thing this type of data logger won't, won't record. Um, but everything else, as long as it goes through this process and you record the steps, you can be assured that you're going to have a good, uh, strong joint afterwards. So this is what a typical uh, graph from a data logger will look like. So you're going to, this is pressure on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So you're going to, first of all, the first few seconds of the fusion uh, process, you're going to beat up. Now what that means is you're going to bring those pipe ends together that you've already faced and got very clean and uniform and parallel to each other. So they're very um, symmetric. 
and you're going to bring them up against the heater plate. The heater plate is going to then start to beat up. You're going to see a melt bead all the way around that pipe. Once you know you see that melt bead first coming up, then you can reduce the pressure, the interfacial pressure, holding those ends together, and you want no interfacial pressure during that heat soak. Now you're just putting all that heat into the polyethylene and, and melting it back to a certain point, several, several thousandths of an inch back in there um, over this whole heat soak time, which is, again, a, a known value for the size of pipe that you're using. You're going to remove the heater plate. And you're going to bring those molten ends back together now with a known and controlled what we call interfacial fusion pressure. And that's going to be this part here. This is when that whole joint's being made. You're going to bring it together. You're going to get the rollback beads. And now that joint's done. Now what you have to do, though, is you have to hold that interfacial pressure during the cooling cycle to make sure that uh, it doesn't move or get pulled apart while it's going from that molten phase to the solid phase and then cooling back down to a temperature that you can then take it out of the fusion machine and start moving it around. You can get this whole um, cycle recorded and uploaded to the cloud where anybody in the world that has access to that cloud account can then go through and review all these to make sure they were done in real time every day before that piece of pipe gets buried. Really key aspect. Another thing that's unique to polyethylene pipe is squeeze off. Um, people that haven't seen this before um, don't believe it, um, but I can guarantee you it is true. It works, and it's a it's a great um, aspect of polyethylene pipe that that can be taken into account. It was actually pioneered by the gas distribution uh, industry into how they can squeeze off uh, polyethylene gas distribution piping um, to do a tie-in or repair, and then open that pipe back up and the pipe's not damaged. And so you can do that uh, with a uh, pipe today up to about 24 inch diameter is about the largest I think they have a squeeze off tool for. And there's a guide for this, PPI TN 54, General Guidelines for Squeeze Off of Polyethylene Pipe for Water, Oil and Gas Applications. This is gonna be different from gas distribution applications, which has some different types of um, caveats in it. But this, you go through this methodology and this will make sure the pipe is not damaged. I'm not gonna play the video here because it takes a while, but this is essentially what a squeeze off tool looks like. It's a barred tool, barred on top and bottom with a very specifically designed radius. And then you squeeze off at a very uh, specific squeeze rate, uh, do your repair, and then you release that squeeze again at a very specific rate. That's going to be key in this process. So for example, within this document, TN54, it's going to tell you for every size pipe, what is the proper parameters for that? So let's look at 16 inch DR9, pretty heavy wall pipe. There's going to have an ID of 12.2 inches. Um, your squeeze rate, bringing that, those two bars together is going to be uh, two inches per minute is the recommended value. And it's going to take you 6.1 minutes to squeeze that pipe totally totally closed with the proper amount of wall compression. If you're below 32 degrees, that, um, that time's going to double. Now your squeeze off rate is only one inch per minute. You do your repair, uh, put a tie-in in, whatever you need to do, and then you're going to release that squeeze. You release it is going to be slower than the compression. That is very, very key. This is when the damage could possibly be done. And then you have to go very slow to make sure the pipe is not damaged on the ID during that release. So normal release time uh, above 32 degrees will be one inch, or excuse me, half inch per minute, resulting in almost 25 minutes just the release time on that 16 inch pipe. If you're below 32 degrees, you got to double that again, and you're going to a quarter inch per minute up to 50 minutes or 49 minutes um, to release that squeeze to make sure that you don't damage it. All this is detailed within this document. If you follow those procedures, you're not going to have a, a um, damaged pipe and it won't be an issue. So if we didn't do that, Stephen, um, that area, you know, it, water main breaks, of course, don't happen at 9 a.m. on a Monday after you've had your coffee. So they're 2 a.m. and one wants to get that water shut off. We just go back through and put a repair clamp around that at that, that time, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, too. You can just throw a repair clamp on it right then. If you want, I mean, any repair clamp that you use on ductile iron or, or PVC, you can use that repair clamp on, on polyethylene to stop that leak immediately. 
And then you can use a squeeze off to cut that piece out later on and then repair it, give a permanent repair. Okay. We've got uh, quite a number of slides to go through and right now it's at um, uh, three o'clock. So we've got in about another 15 minutes. I'll have to accelerate you a little bit there, Stephen. So there we go. All right. Thanks for keeping me on track. Um, repair options, a great, another, another very good document to look at. So we get that question a lot. Well, I like to put polyethylene pipe, but what happens if it gets damaged? What happens if a backhoe hit it or I need to repair it or a directional drill hits it? So the Municipal Advisory Board put together this quick little um, document that kind of goes through and gives you a, a flow chart of what type of uh, leak that I find or damage that I find. Is it a one hole puncture? Is it punctured both sides? Is it totally severed? Uh, what type of repair do I want to do? Mechanical fitting, electrofusion, and then it'll go through and just step you through the process. If you do this, I got to remove the pipe segment with butt fusion, install new set new segment with two electrofusion couplings. There's your repair option for this particular situation. Um, so you don't have to know everything about it. It's going to step you through there and give you the most uh, logical and reasonable repair option that's available to you. And you can see there's a multitude of repairs, electrofusion repair patch, uh, electrofusion coupling to put a, a new pipe spool piece in there, uh, or a flange adapter if you'd rather just go to a flange after that, or a fully mechanical coupling with full restraint pullout works just as well also. Um, the same thing I just went through, trying to hurry up a little bit. Um, wait a minute, I think we're about done, aren't we? Where are we? So um, we talked about um, important resources such as AWWA um, C906. Um, so C AWWA C906 is polyethylene pressure, pressure pipe, four inch through 65 inch um, for polyethylene for water and wastewater systems. Um, You've got some case studies after this. This was just oh, yeah. summarizing the resources. Perfect, here we go. Um, horizontal directional drilling. Polyethylene is the number one material used for all HDD applications. It's not used for all of them, but it's the number one used in about 60, 65% of all HDD installs. It uses polyethylene pipes. Um, F1962 is a great guide for how you design and utilize polyethylene pipe for these systems. Also, um, underground installation, if you take a look at that for sewers and other gravity flow applications, is ASTM D2322. So take a look at that also. Um, case studies. So nobody wants to be the first one to say, well, I don't know, polyethylene's this newfangled thing. It's only been around for 60 plus years. Um, I don't wanna be the first one to use it for this application. Well, I can assure you, you're not. Um, and there's hundreds and hundreds of case studies and again, polyethylene's been used as a pressure pipe for 60 plus years. So every every application uh, it has been used for, and there's case studies around all of those. Uh, the Alliance for PE Pipe has a great searchable a database, which has over 350 case studies. They pulled together just over the last, what, seven, eight, nine years. Um, so that's a great resource. You can go through and see, all right, has somebody used it for this? Has somebody used this size pipe? for this particular type of application. You can go in and find all that within the PE Alliance website. Um, as an example, you have, um, oh, my uh, screen's covered up here just a little bit. There we go. You have this uh, canal conversion. We see this uh, happening a lot in the West now. All the canals they have out there to bring water, irrigation water, or no drinking water to these dry states um, have open canals. Well, they want to try to conserve that water as much as possible now. So they're converting the irrigation canals, open canals, to closed canals, and a lot of times using polyethylene pipe to do this. So this is a great example of the Ashley Upper Irrigation Company and the Highline Canal in Utah. They use 10,000 feet of 24-inch pipe, 26,000 feet of 30-inch, almost 60,000 feet of 36-inch, 48,000 feet of 48 inch for a total of 27 miles, almost 27 miles of polyethylene pipe to enclose this irrigation canal. So you can imagine all the different types of things they had to uh, go through and then they encompassed and encountered uh, during that installation of this, of this amazing system. 
Um, force mains. Again, we see polyethylene now becoming probably the number one material for replacing failing force mains. That's probably the most rigorous application out there in the water and wastewater area because of the constant cycling of the pumps and the cyclic fatigue that these are going to go through. Um, it's going to tear up a lot of different types of appurtenances and piping materials. Polyethylene, because of its surge capacity and ductility, is uniquely designed and capable of handling this. So we see polyethylene being used many, many times to replace these failing systems. This is uh, Westminster, California, force frame replacement, 20,000 feet of 36-inch VR-17. They ran dual lines of this to have a redundant system. Um, we see it all over the country, um, this being this going on now for larger diameter force mains and polyethylene replacing that. Oh, yeah, Stephen. And then we didn't show it, but there's another job for low pressure force main in South Beach that was uh, 4,500 feet of 54 inch. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out specific to this picture that we're looking at is this contractor understood the paradigm shift in installing pipe um, and more production through opening up larger areas. So they went and rented more trench boxes. They've already disturbed the center uh, island uh, center median for this roadway. So they figured... Let's just go ahead and get as much installed as possible. And they're starting to see that uh, production run by installing more pipe all at once. So definitely a good way to do it. Glad you brought these ones up, Steve. Yeah, that's good. Like I said, fuse up large sections and pull them all into place uh, all at one time and get them in there, do your backfill, and you're good to go. So there is some software out there, too. I'm not going to get too much in depth on these. Uh, but these are great online tools to go to. You can just play with different scenarios and try to see, um, you know, what type of design I need or different flow capacities, frictional losses uh, for the HTP app calculator. Again, that's at www.htpapp.com. I always wonder why they called it HTPE app, um, but I figured I, I was told that it was designed like an app uh, for your phone or your smart device but it's not certified as an app. So it's a piece of software that resides at this, at this address that, utilize, that works as an app and you can use it on your phone or tablet um, as well uh, through this website. Uh, PPI Bore, it's a great first look tool at a directional drill job. It'll give you um, all the guidance you need to see what DR might I need because that's gonna kind of direct your, your um, application depending on how long you're gonna be pulling that through the depth of burial, and will, it, will this type of DR selection work for that, or do I need something heavier, or will something lighter actually work? Great tool for that. Um, and then you also have the PPI Pace software. This is probably my favorite software because this goes through the pipe analysis and calculation environment developed by the University of Waterloo at www.ppipace.com. Um, so that'll give you real world side by side comparison in a operating environment for ductile iron, PVC and polyethylene um, to show you that what do you need to pick to get a comparable design off each material. It's going to be different. Their pressure classes mean different things. Their surge capacity um, is different for each material. Um, fatigue resistance is different. Corrosion resistance, flow capabilities, frictional loss, all that's going to be different. So you put in your actual operating conditions and you can see how each material compares. So back on the HTTP app, this is what you're going to see. Click on the accept button. Um, they're going to come up with very basic pipe information. Put in your size that pipe do you have, 12 inch DR17, uh, dips OD sizing. It's just give you basic uh, information about it. Here's my outside diameter. Here's my pressure rating. Um, let's say it's 73 degrees, here's a bunch of calculated values. Click on this more button, and you'll see a list of about 15 different types of values that's um, related just to that piece of pipe. Great place to go to, great resource. Um, you can look at in, um, operating conditions. So let's look at the application. Let's click on pressure flow. What am I gonna get with that? Well, let's say you have a piece of eight inch uh, IPS DR11, you got a mile of it. It's operating at 80 to 100 PSI, and I need to get 750 gallons per minute through that pipe. What's gonna be my pressure drop needed and at what velocity? Because those are two very key design aspects, right? So we know right off the bat without even going to the software that DR11 has a max pressure rating 
of 200 PSI at 73 degrees. It's also going to have one and a half times that in your recurring surge capacity. That's up to 300 PSI. So 200 plus another 100 to give you 300 PSI surge capacity on everyday basis, 10 million cycles, 55 cycles a day for 100 years. And occasional surges, which is going to be a few million cycles <laughs> over 100 years, at 400 PSI, double the, double the pressure class or pressure rating. So we know that just off the bat. So you go to the HTP app. Let's say I'm going to solve for frictional pressure loss. And I'm going to see, okay, at a mile of it, at 750 gallons per minute, I'm going to have a frictional loss of 37 PSI and a fluid velocity of 6.3 feet per second. That's well within the design window of polyethylene pipe. So you're not going to have any problems there. Um, you can even go up to 12 feet per second with polyethylene pipe and not have any issues based on surge. Real key aspect. You can play with all these different ways of solving that. Um, you can look at installation. You can look at unrestrained um, above ground applications. You can look at below ground applications. Again, because Alan's going to come on and yell at me for going too slow. Um, but it talks about maximum pulling force for slip lining or above ground anchor forces, suspension. What's my suspension um, a span that I need if I'm going across a bridge or something like that? Um, below ground, what's my pull force for slip lining, thrust block design, uh, buckling pressures that I might need, earth loading, buoyancy, all that. You can go through those calculations and try different scenarios. Um, thermal expansion contraction. Um, polyethylene does have a higher thermal expansion uh, coefficient. However, it's very easy to restrain because the force that it develops is very, very small. So with polyethylene pipe, let's say you got a piece of 200 feet of pipe and the delta T of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you may get, theoretically, as much as 8-inch um, expansion from that. Well, to restrain that, it's only going to take 320 pounds to restrain that with. Whereas if you had carbon steel pipe, yeah, it may only move three quarters or three fifths of an inch, but it's going to take 8,000 pounds to restrain that piece of carbon steel pipe if you don't want it to move off that flange adapter or that, um, that valve that you may have in place. So again, you need to take all that into account with polyethylene. So we've got three minutes left. I suggest you go to PPI Pace and end it with that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, let's get to that real quick. It's slide 70. Oh, there's a lot of earth loading here. Yeah, sorry about that. No worries. It's all good stuff. I just talked too much at the beginning. My apologies, Stephen. Back to you. Now, we talked about borate a little bit. I, I talked about all of these things. So uh, this is just a, a slide of the borate calculation and what it, what it tells you, what works and what doesn't. And here's the pace calculation. So let's say, that's like I mentioned here. So it talks about HDPE ductile iron and PVC. So you're going to pick the same sizes, 10 inch uh, DIPS sizing system, pressure class 125, pressure class 350 for ductile iron and pressure class 235 for um, PVC. Very common, very easy to use. So you can see all different pressure classes, but will they work in the application? Pipe length, velocity, um, recurring or recurring surge, occasional surge, working pressure, 70 PSI, Surges per day, 100-year design life. What's it going to take to get that? Uh, I'll give you examples about where all these came, numbers came from and support for that. It's going to show you how many surges per day. 55 is, is what all the design manuals recommend that you go with. Um, that's not anything unusual. And then it's going to give you this output. It's going to say, all right, for these situations, well, my flow rate is all going to be comparable. Uh, my head loss is all going to be comparable. Um, my total surge, that's where it's going to really start seeing some differences now because ductile iron doesn't have the same surge capacity that uh, polyethylene has. It has a flat 100 PSI. So make sure that's designed for and it'll take that into and you can take that into account. PVC has no surge capacity above the pressure class for everyday surges. It does have it for an occasional up to 1.6 times. So again, take that into account. Polyethylene has the one and a half and two times surge capacity above its pressure class. So it's going to see, all right, am I, do I have a hundred year design life on fatigue? Um, and that's how your pipes are going to fail in these situations anyway. So you want a hundred year design life based on that. This gives you a real world comparison. And this is just the graphic output of the same information from the previous slide. Uh, real world comparison on the different materials. 
Again, they all work if you design with them the right way, an appropriate way. What do you think, Alan? Yeah, lots, lots of different resources. And and Stephen, your uh, um, method, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? I'm flabbergasted. You covered it all. <laughs> See, that's exactly what was going on. I'm a little, on. I'm a little too wordy. Is that what it is? <laughs> no, no, no. You're very thorough. And that's the best way wow. to be able to, to be when you're talking about resources in this manner. Because there's a lot of people out there that have lots of detailed questions. We got a lot of questions um, here yeah. as well. If you go to the next slide, you'll see contact. Uh, and definitely, if you need to be able to get us, um, this is how you would do so. Uh, and then also um, uh, at the end of this webinar is the survey, of course, for those PDHs, which we know everybody really wants. Um, but I, I want to thank you very much, so, uh, Stephen, for being very thorough with all the resources. And then Don Liu for, for talking to us about real-world problems uh, and trying to solve water supply issues and needs for uh, other people and what the, the Engineers Without Borders continues to do. Yeah, so, it was fun to hear from Don today. And uh, yeah. Stephen, I, I want to say thank you so much for putting this deck together. And uh, sorry we didn't have enough time for it, but really great content. And, you know, honestly, we only lost a couple of people through the end. So I think everybody appreciated it. And also, Alan, tell us about our webinar tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow is going to be a classic webinar as well. That is uh, HDPE versus PVC. Uh, so we've asked uh, Dustin Langston to take it down just a notch uh, to be able to help us with this. And he's very passionate about it. Uh, it's going to be pretty comprehensive and we're very excited about it. Over 600 registrants for tomorrow. Uh, so that's that's uh, quite a bit. And we had 60% yield today, Pete. That was probably a record for us for a while. So yeah, I was pretty good. And pleased. Alan, uh, please good. remind us how to get our PDHs. Uh, stay on, and there'll be a survey at the end of this uh, webinar, and you can complete which survey questions will make sure that you get right to your, your PDHs as you need them. Good. Well, thanks so much, everybody. We'll sign off so you can fill out that form, and we'll hopefully we'll see a bunch of you tomorrow. Till next time, we'll see you on the road. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Peter.